Amen. <clears throat> Dre, my man, my man, the greatest of these. Uh, the speaker is no stranger to us today. Uh, we first met him when he was at Souls West and selling books. I know he graduated from Soul West, and uh, is, he was, I think you were born here? Were you born in Odessa? Born and raised in Odessa. Um, and so I, I won't tell too much of his story, but I'll let him tell it. But I mean, we, we, we've been here, and we're going to have a, uh, we're going to be blessed by him, Jay. So thank you. We'll, thank you for coming here. All right, let me just set up real quick, y'all. Testing, 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 testing. Can y'all hear me? Yes, awesome. Okay, cool. I'm not used to this. It's a little fancy. I usually have like a mic and stuff. And so, awesome. Well, happy Sabbath and good morning, church. It's so lovely to see y'all this morning. And yes, my brother, uh, I'm born and raised here. I'm from here, just a little introduction about me. I'm born and raised here. And let me see, I actually, my life was changed uh, four years ago, four or five years ago. And, you know, I became an Adventist Christian and became a Christian, became an Adventist. And yeah, I had uh, Bible studies, oh, I forget your name, but Caesar Silva and his mama, we would have Bible studies. And oh, that was so cool. I would ask Brother Caesar until like in the morning, just questions about the Bible and stuff. And he would, he would be there. And also with Tommy Boycourt, if any of y'all know Tommy from the Midland Church. Yeah, so 2019, 2018, I was like really, you know, getting grown. And I was like, dang, maybe I do need Jesus in my life, so. So I started studying, and I had those Bible studies with Tommy and Caesar, and they changed my life. And obviously, and on, on top of that, I met the young people from Souls West in 2019. And just meeting them and getting books from them and then reading The Great Controversy, Steps of Christ, things like that, it changed my life. Now I'm here. And in 2020, I applied to Souls West, and the rest is history. You know? So God has been so good. I'm just like, I'm on cloud nine every day. I'm like, man, Jesus, you know, especially now that I'm like, got bills and stuff. I'm like, man, I really need Jesus. You know? So, you know, so no, nah, it's been, it's been great. But that's just a little bit about me. And yes, and now for today, I just have a little something that I've been wanting to share for for maybe many of y'all, this may be like review. This is like, oh, okay, like I know this already. For some of y'all, it may be an enlightenment. God is love. And I wanted to share this today because it's something that's been on my heart heavy these past couple of months. Um, you know, I'm really close with the Midland Church and I help out with their youth and stuff and I've just been teaching them some things like for Sabbath school. And God is love is like the biggest issue that I hit with them. And sharing it, teaching them with them, just helps me to get to know it even more. I'm like, man, you really don't know something unless you can explain it or teach it yourself. And now that I've been explaining and teaching it over and over again, I'm like, wow, it's been touching me. Not only that, after Souls West, I did a year of ministry in California. And I lived out there for a while. And it was just such a blessing. But uh, so many people don't, don't know that there is a God of love out there that loves them, you know, unconditionally. And I was, man, that is the fundamental. That is the foundation of everything. And that's what we're going to go over today. So, yes, I'm excited. And I know it's going to be a blessing because it has been for me. But before I keep on going, uh, let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for this Sabbath day. I thank you so much for this time of fellowship. Holy Spirit, help us to understand you and your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So I just have a few points with y'all today. I hope y'all have your Bibles. I love Bibles. So, you know, 
Just follow along. I don't get no slides, so don't look up there. You know, I don't do slides. I like Bibles. I like Bibles, okay? So, first and foremost, let's go to our verse. 1 John 4, 8. 1 John 4, 8. I ask this question. Who is God? What is God? We find that in 1 John 4, 8. This is a question I had, you know, a few years ago. Who is God? What is God? You know, as Christians, as followers of his word, we have a a reference or a source point for everything that we believe. And the answer to this question is found in 1 John 4, 8. Everybody there? Amen? Amen, amen. 1 John 4, 8, it reads, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. What is God? Love is who? God, right from the Bible. God is love. When I, when I first found this out, I was like, okay, that's cool. What does that mean, though? God is love. How many of us are human? Anybody human here? Everybody human. Okay, cool. I'm pretty sure since y'all human, y'all have experienced. Someone's told you they loved you, but then they do you wrong. Stab you in the back, they hurt you. Have y'all experienced that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Y'all human. And that's like, for me, I'm like, I've, had, I've experienced that. Someone's told me they love me. Someone's told me they got me. And they do me wrong. Stab me in my back. And that hurts. I'm like, man, that hurts. You know, I'm like, man, is this what love is? Then I have always had a misconception of what love is. And you know, hearing this, God is love, I'm like, all right, whatever. I was like, I've heard that many times before, and then they do me wrong. It's like, maybe God's the same way. What's the definition of what real love is? Not only that, there was this illustration that was brought to my mind. And it's like, we say we love a lot of things. Like I say, I love my car, I love my little brother, he's my best friend, and I love pineapple. I love pineapple, y'all. But do you think I love pineapple the same way that I love my little brother? No. Oh, do you think I love my car the same way that I love my best friend, my little brother? No, of course not. Then what, at that point, what does love really mean? What is the definition? Thank God for his word. We have an answer. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The true definition of what love is. It's right here in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 13. For y'all theologians out there, Bible scholars, 1 Corinthians 13 is known as the love chapter. So if you ever want to start learning about love, what that really means, what that really looks like, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You're going to learn about love right here. We're going to look specifically at verse, verses 4 and 5. Verses in five. Can I get an amen when we're there? Amen. Awesome. In the King James, it has charity, but charity is just an old English word for love. It means the same thing. So I'm going to replace the word charity with love. So the same. But it says, love suffereth long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not vaunt itself up. It is not puffed up. It does not behave itself unseemly. It does not seek its own. It is not easily provoked. It does not think no evil. Right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 and 5, we have descriptions of what true love is. Love suffers long. It endures. It's kind. It does not envy. It doesn't puff up itself. It doesn't boast. It doesn't act unseemly, out of hand. But the greatest description, the greatest definition of what love is, is found in verse 5. The second description, it says, does not seek her own. In the NIV, it says, uh, it does not seek its own. Hold on, I have it in my notes. It does not insist on its own way. This right here is the greatest definition of what love is. If I could sum it up in one word, 
Thank you so much for putting it on the screen. If I could sum love up in one word, it is selflessness. Selfless. Love is completely selfless. This is the character of the God that we know. Completely selfless. True love, God, is not self-centered, but others-centered. It is not worried about its own interests or benefits. It's worried about the interests and benefits of others. This is true love. You know true love is being demonstrated towards you when you know someone is trying to look out for the best interests in your behalf. An example, I think one of the greatest examples of true love in this world is a parent's love, specifically a mama's love. Um, yeah, mama's love, love my mama. Love my dad too, but well, shout out to mama right now. But an example, there was one time, you know, when I was being converted in like 2019, 2020, and then I was going to Souls, Souls West. Uh, I just, I wasn't the best towards my mom and dad. And then when I left, I moved and I went to Souls West and then I lived in Vegas for a while. And I just, I was horrible to like my mom and dad. And then when I would see them, when I would come back, it's just like, oh man, you know, treating my mama bad, you know? Made her cry every time we talked. Every time I saw my dad, we'd get in fights, we'd argue. And it just wasn't good, it just wasn't good. One time I came back from Vegas for the holiday season, saw my mama just to say what's up. I'm like, hey, I'm here for a few days. Kicked it with friends. And I was going back, going back to Vegas. I was like, hey, I'm leaving, whatever. And our, our relationship was still, ugh, no bueno. And before I left, I pulled up to my mom's house and I was like, hey, my mom gone. You know, good to see you, but I'm gone. And then she made me, she bought me this new cooler and it was filled with burritos. And I was like, okay. She told me, she's like, me, I want you to be all right on the road. I was like, okay. And then she gave me $100. Like after everything I done did to her. Like talk to her bad, make her cry. And I was like, dang. Like there's nothing, out of everything I did, it didn't matter. Like she still looked out for me. You know? And it may seem small, but for me that was big. I was like, dang. And like I'm on the, on the road, I'm all like cr crying and stuff. I'm like, oh, my mama, you know? And, but yeah, that's just an example of true love, selflessness. In this case, with my mama, it didn't matter how I treated her. And so she always looked out for my interests, my benefits. In this context, that's who God is. There's nothing that you can do, there's nothing that you can't do that's ever going to affect his love for you. Romans 8, Romans is, oh, Romans is so good. Romans 8, verses 38 and 39 tells us there is nothing, nothing in this world, there's no height, depth, nothing in creation, it says, that will ever separate the love of God from you. No matter how bad you act, no matter what you do, this, this, or that, there is nothing that will ever separate that. He is always going to love you. He is always going to look out for your interests, for your benefits, because he is selfless. It's not about him. He does everything on our behalf. This is the greatest definition of what love is. Going on, I would do this same study with people in California and I would do like so many Bible studies and tell this to them and they would be like, oh, you know, this is so great. I was like, yes, this is who we know. And I would always get these questions of like, okay, if God loved me so much, y'all heard this, you know, if God loved me so much, why is there so much pain and suffering, you know? Or why do I go through things? If he really is looking out for me, why do I go through things so much? I was like, hmm. I was like, that's a valid question. That's a legitimate question. Let's look into that. And I saw this point, it's trials. God doesn't necessarily send trials our way. He doesn't be like, oh, this, here's this hardship. Boom, I'm gonna throw it on him. No, that is not God. But it's trials permitted out of love. God allows things to happen in our lives. What does this mean? Let's go to James chapter one, verses two through four. James chapter one, verses two through four. 
This is building on the point, trials permitted out of love. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. And if I can get an amen when y'all there. Amen. Awesome. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, and it reads, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. All right, what does all this mean? I know that old English is kind of confusing sometimes. When I read it, I'm like, oh, what's that mean? But for what it's talking about, God allows things in our lives to grow our character, to help us to be stronger. Trials or hard times grow your character and you as an individual. They also, this is old Kelly Clarkson song, I don't know if y'all know it, but she goes like, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I was like, that's so true. When you go through things, if you never went through nothing, you would grow. But when you, grow, when you go through things, then you t- start to grow. Those experiences bring wisdom into your life. You know what I'm They're not necessarily a curse, but rather a blessing. Sometimes we don't understand. I'm like, whoa, what's going on? I remember one time, uh, ooh, well, I was homeless. I used to be homeless and just struggling. And I was homeless, living in my car. And then I would bounce house to house with my friends. And that was just a hard time. And I was like, man, I don't know why I'm going through this. I don't know why, what's going on, this is this. And, but you know, I grew from that. It helped me to be more self-reliant. I was like, okay, I, I need to take care of this. I need to make better decisions. You know, I need to make better choices. And going through those hard times, it helped me learn that. You know, what I couldn't be taught, I had to go through hardships. And that helped me to grow so much. When I went into ministry in California, there were so many homeless people. And going through that, I was like, man, I know what you're going through. Not only has this helped, those hardships helped me, but now I can also relate to you. God allows trials in our lives, not only to grow you as an individual, to help you grow in your character, but also to help you relate to others. If you never went through nothing, you never know what other people are going through. Just like me being homeless and stuff, when I saw those people, you know, previously before I was homeless, I was like, ah, man, them fools are bums. Ah, man, they ain't do nothing. They there because this, this, and that. They deserve to be there. Then when I went through it, I was like, man, I have more sympathy, more empathy towards my fellow brother, my fellow sister. As if I'm better than someone, no. I was like, no, I know, I understand. Another example, you know, we, death, Reigns in this world, unfortunately. It's okay. One day, Jesus is coming back, though. But there was one time I experienced this death in my family, and it hurt. It was hard. I was like, oof, this one, that, that rocked my world. And I just never experienced something like that. But when I experienced something like that, like previously, before I went through that death in my family, I couldn't relate to like people when they would go through things, lose a loved one. They tell me, I'm like, man, dude, that's crazy. You know, I feel for you. My condolences, whatever. But then when I went through that and then I met someone who had that same experience, I'll be like, ooh, I know what you're going through. I can relate to you now. I can encourage you through that now. And now looking back, I'm grateful because God has brought me through that. Not only has it helped me grow in character as an individual, but it also helps me to relate to others, to show love to others as well. Previously, I couldn't do that. I couldn't get down with them and be like, understand where they're at. But now I'm like, no, oh, I know what you're going through. I can relate and encourage you through this hardship. These are why trials are allowed. They're permitted from God out of love. Once again, it's helped us to grow in our character as individuals and to relate to others. Right next to it, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, excuse me. How does, how does God, how does God relate to all this? Trials permitted out of love. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9 tells us, 
Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Are we there? Amen. Thank you for putting it on the screen. It says, though he were a son, yet he, through obedience, yet he learned by obedience the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey him. God never tells us something that he himself hasn't gone through. Jesus himself went through trials permitted out of love. He went through so much that it perfected his character. He suffered an immeasurable amount. We can never know how much Jesus suffered, especially on that cross. We'll never know. But he suffered so much, he can now relate to everyone on this world. It may not be the exact situation you go through, but in principle, Jesus knows exactly how to relate to you, how to encourage you, how to lift you up from any trial that comes into your life. This is who we know. His character of love clearly revealed through all of this. Once again, I'd just like to show you how this all relates. John 15, 14. Let's turn there real quick. John chapter 15, verse 14. Are we there? Amen. Not 14, verse 13, excuse me. John chapter 15, verse 13. Ooh. Okay, hold your spot right there. Also go to Romans 5, 8. Romans 5, 8. Hold your, hold your spot in John 15, though. We need that. Mm, mm. Okay, let's go back to John. Yes, yes. So I'm like piecing it together in my head. All right, John chapter 15, verse 13. Are we there? Amen? Amen. All right. It reads, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. I'm going to read that again. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Once again, it's love It's it's love being repeated. It's defined the same, just in a different phrase. My brother, can I use you as an example real quick? Come on, come on, come on. I'll put you on the spot. So Jesus says, greater love had no man than a man laid down his life for his friends. What's your your name, brother? Bryce. Bryce? I'm Jay. Nice to meet you. All right. Bryce is my friend, right? If a bullet's coming towards Bryce, I'm going to jump in the way. In that act, I'm not thinking anything about myself. I'm thinking completely about the entrance, the interests and benefits of my brother Bryce. It's selflessness being repeated once again. This theme, this principle is repeated all throughout the Bible. Selflessness. God is completely selfless. Greater love had no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. At that point, he's saying selfless. This is true love. Thank you, brother Bryce. I appreciate you, man. Greater love had no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus says there's no greater love, but it's as if he takes it like a step further, like he does a one-up on on that. This is where we go to Romans 5, 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Hope y'all turn there. Also on the screen. Thank you. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Are we there? Amen. It says, but God commended his love. God demonstrated his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, while we were his adversaries, while we were his enemies, while we were against him, Jesus still went all the way for you. He still died for you. Past tense. Jesus still went all the way. Whether you were his friend or not, it does not matter. This shows us, Romans 5, 8 shows us He is unconditional. There's nothing that you can do. There's nothing that you can't do that is ever going to affect what he's going to do for you. This is so amazing to know that no matter what I do, no matter how far off the rails I may seem to go, it does not matter. Jesus still looks at me just the same. He will never love me more. He will never love me less than he already does right now. Not only me, but for y'all as well. This is the God that we serve. This is the God that we know. 
this God of love. You may be thinking to yourself, this is elementary, like simple. Yes, it is. But this is everything, y'all. This is everything. This is the whole point. This is the framework that everything fits in. Love. It's love. This is the greatest and biggest thing you could ever know in your life. God's character of love. Completely selfless. It's all about love. This is who he is. This is the God that we serve. Before he is king, before he is creator, before he is our savior, he is love. This is who we know. This is who I know. This is who the Bible tells us about. This good, good God of love. 1 Corinthians 13, let's go back there. First Corinthians 13. We're going to read a little bit. Remember, this is the love chapter, y'all. If you ever want to know about love, go to First Corinthians 13. It's good. And this one, I love Paul. Paul is so, he's very sarc- sarcastic. And he's, he's funny, man. He's funny. But in verse 1, we'll see, we'll see where I'm getting at. Paul says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Paul is saying, let me read it in a a different version. I like how the ESV says it. We got this old English. Still good, though. In the ESV, it says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. He's saying, in this context, tongues is languages. He's saying, if I can speak all the languages in the world in the context of professing the gospel, if I can speak the tongues of angels, otherworldly tongues, he's so funny. He's saying, but I don't have love. I don't know love. All you is is just making noise. You saying a whole lot, but you ain't talking about nothing. That's what he's saying. If you don't have love, it doesn't really mean anything. Verse 2. I like this. He says, and if I have all prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am what? Nothing. Nothing. Imagine you knew everything about prophecy. You could, you could do gymnastics in the theology room. You can be like, oh yeah, this means this, this, and this. You could break down the minor prophets, major prophets, revelation, like cake. It's easy. And so you knew everything. You had all faith where you could literally move a mountain. You'd be like, oh, mountain, go over. Okay. Something simple. But you don't have love? It don't mean nothing. Who cares? What, what, what good is that if you don't even know love? Verse 3. If I give all I have away, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. You can do all the good deeds you want. You can be Bill Gates times 10, trillion dollars. Philanthropist, always helping out people. Charity, charity, charity. You know, Mr. Beast type, giving out money. You You can do all that, but if you don't got love, it don't mean nothing. It doesn't mean anything. This is what Paul's trying to say. The greatest, everything else is built. Who cares? Who cares if you know all the 28 fundamentals? You can break it down like clockwork. Who cares? Do you know God? Do you know his character? Do you know love? Are you walking in that? Are you growing in that? This is what it means. Then it continues reading. Love is patient and kind. Once again, going over it. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. 
It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Verse seven, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Verse eight, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Verse 13. Let's jump down to verse 13. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. We're well into the new year, second week. Church family, brothers and sisters, friends. As you continue growing, as you continue learning, as you continue getting better in your life, in all aspects, especially in the spiritual, spiritual sense, your relationship with God, as you keep growing, as you keep getting better, build upon this. Do I allow God's word? Do I just believe him, trust him to work this in me? Love. Everything is built upon this. I encourage you, I suggest to you, as you keep going on throughout this new year, that you build on this love. Demonstrate it towards your friends and family. Demonstrate it towards people at the workplace. Strangers, be practical. I've taken God at his word. You know, be selfless, look at others' interests and benefits. And now my relationship with my family is a thousand times better than it has ever been in my life. Like I can actually call my mom and my dad friends. They're no longer my parents, they're my friends and I can talk to them, you know? People at the workplace, they acting crazy. <sighs> I can, I can take a step back and be like, no, you know, I still love you. I still want to look at your interests, your benefits. How can I help you, even though we have this situation? You know, how can I help? That's God. That's God. Another practical thing. You were strangers. This is how they know. This is how they know God, by the love that you share. I remember one time we were doing ministry. We knocked on this dude's door, offering community services, specifically Bible studies. And he was so, like, not interested. He's like, yeah, whatever, bro. Y'all sign up. All right, y'all can leave. <laughs> and I was like, okay. His name was Justin Luhan. I'll never forget it. And we came up to bro's door the next day. He was like, oh, my gosh. Like, he thought we were Jehovah witnesses or like Mormons or something. And he's like, oh, y'all trying to preach to me. Y'all trying to get me baptized. And we're like, no, man, like, what's up? We just came to chill. And we spent an hour just talking to bro, watching football. And just talking, kicking it. You know, didn't mention the Bible, didn't mention God, nothing like that. We're just chick kicking it with him. I was like, hey, bro, want to go to In-N-Out? You know, this is California. They, they love In-N-Out. And we're like, yeah, man. So we'll go. And we made a friend. Like, we really just, like, we're hanging out. Next week, did the same thing. It's NFL season during this time, so we're, I'm big on football. My Texans playing today, you know. They're going to beat the Browns, y'all. All right, my bad. My bad. <laughs> no, but we, talk, we went to a, a sports bar. I forgot. It was either, like, Buffalo Wild Wings or something, but we went, ate some wings, and just talking about football. And the World Series was going on at the time, too. And we're talking about the World Series, you know. Shout out Rangers, they won. But yeah, we were just talking. It was like, hey man, you know, this, this, and that. Didn't really talk about God, the Bible, nothing like that. We just kicked it with him. And he was like, man, dude, I appreciate y'all. Y'all know Nick, right? Y'all remember Nick? Yeah, Nick was there too. And we were just being a friend. Next week, same thing. We went out. Went out to a sports bar, watched the NFL game, you know. They're big on the Raiders out there, so it was a Raiders game. I'm like, oh, you know, Raiders, duh. And we're just 
And it finally came to a point he started opening up. And I asked him, I was like, hey, man, you know, like, my purpose being out here is for y'all to know Jesus. And he just started flowing. I was like, man, dude, I thought y'all were just, like, fake, you know, that y'all had to do this, like y'all were getting paid or something. I never thought, like, I would make friends. And saying, so, y'all really show me, like, there's people out there that care about me, that love me. And I was like, yes, man, of course. And he's like, man, I've really been opening up to, like, spiritual and religion stuff, and I'm just wondering right now. I was like, really, man? He's like, yeah. And y'all just popped up on my door. Like, I just think it's funny. There's no coincidences, y'all. That day I gave him a Bible, and it was his first time ever holding a Bible. He's like, man, I never had a Bible before. And he was just tearing up. Like, man, thank you. He ended up coming to church. Lived right by the church, too. Literally walked in like three minutes. Walking. I was like, man, dude. Yeah, and he just kept going to church, you know. I don't know what happened to him. I haven't kept in touch with him, but I just know something good was happening. And then, yeah, my boy back home keeps in touch with him. We see him like, hey, man, how you doing? And that soul was, that soul was one that day. And we knocked on his door, just showed him love. This is practical. This is practical, y'all. You can do it today, like in five minutes. Today. As we continue in this new year, build upon this. Love, it is the greatest thing, the greatest of these, as our word tells us. With that being said, let's pray. Oh God, thank you so much for who you are. Just want to say thank you, Lord. That you are love. You are selfless. You do everything on our behalf. And we just thank you. Just thank you for who you are. I thank God that you are God. Thank you for you and your word. Just can't say thank you enough. Give you all praise and glory. And we appreciate you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Closing for a closing song, let's sing Jesus, What a Friend for Sinners, hymn number 187. 187. Shall we all rise? Baby.
Father God, thank you for this day. Just thank you so much, Lord God, for everything that you're going to do. Thank you for this new year. Uh, help us just to go into this new year, walking in your character, complete in love. Thank you for this Sabbath day, and I pray that we enjoy this time of fellowship. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>